Hello, welcome to the vast majority. I'm Jack, the managing editor, Micah Utrecht, recording live from quarantine, where maybe we will all be for the rest of our lives. Our boy Bernie is facing some pretty tough odds in the Democratic race right now. Tough odds both in the delegate math against Joe Biden, but also in the fact that it's a bit difficult to campaign during a pandemic. And we shouldn't totally count him out yet because who knows what Biden is going to say or do next and who knows what the threshold is for Democratic Party leaders in mainstream media. Who knows at what point they'll see like their 48th, you know, absolutely cringeworthy and completely nonsensical live stream or MSNBC interview from Biden and decide that they have to be the adult in the room and yank Biden off the stage. Who knows what's going to happen there? But there's no getting around that things are looking pretty tough for Bernie. He should absolutely stay in the race because he has a critical role to play in keeping progressive policies on the national agenda, but his odds for winning the presidency are definitely stacked against him. But rather than bemoan this state of affairs, we should start assessing what we've learned from the Sanders campaign and where we go from here. And it is my contention that where we are after two Bernie Sanders presidential runs, after the rebirth of socialism on the national stage, after the explosion in membership and relevance of a group like the Democratic Socialists of America, after a teacher strike wave and worker militancy exploding during this pandemic, after all of these things, we're actually in pretty good shape, which makes that conversation about where we should go from here all the more urgent. And that is exactly what me and my guest today Jackman staff writer Megan Day do in our new book, which is out this week from Verso Books. It's called Bigger Than Bernie, How We Go From the Sanders Campaign to Democratic Socialism. Now, I have to say, dear listener, that if you had any plans to write a book and release it during a pandemic, I would strongly advise against it. We had a big national tour planned for the book, which is, of course, now postponed. And once lockdown is lifted, it's possible that we will be coming to a city near you. But all plans for that are, like everything else in the world right now, on hold. But despite the obviously unforeseen pandemic, I think that the book holds up pretty well. And in this conversation, Megan and I work our way through most of it. You can buy a hardcover copy for very cheap, either from Verso at versobooks.com or from the Jacobin store at jacobinmag.com slash store. I will put a link to the Jacobin store in the show notes. So here's Megan Day and I talking about our new book, Bigger Than Bernie, how we go from the Sanders campaign to democratic socialism, out now from Verso. Hi, Megan. Hi, Micah. How are you? I'm, I'm, you know, all things considered, I'm, I'm pretty good. Uh, you and I wrote a book that came out yesterday, uh, the day before we are recording this, which is pretty awesome. And we're going to talk about it. Yeah, it's great. Congratulations, Micah. Congratulations to you. If anybody is feeling down about the, you know, copious amounts of dystopian nightmare-ish news about the coronavirus, they should seek out the photo of you that you tweeted that I believe was taken by your partner of the moment when you got your hands on your copy, your physical copy of our book. And it's just a very pure and beautiful moment. I, I was really I, happy. You love to see it. It's been a long time in the making. It felt really good to finally hold it in my hands. Also, other people were receiving it before me. And I was seeing photographs <laughs> of other people online being like, look what I just got. And it made me really jealous. You're, if you're referring to me. <laughs> no, no, and not just you. There were other, also other people, like people were getting like, like copies to review and stuff. Well, you know, it's it, the coronavirus is throwing a wrench into many parts of the supply chain. So we won't we won't hold it against our our wonderful publisher who uh, have been nothing but angels throughout this. Entire oh, it's process, true. So. They've been working overtime to make sure that they can actually get this book into anybody's hands. It's just such a strange situation that we're in. Yeah, before we move on, serious shout out to Natasha Elena Ullman, our publicist, and Ben Maybe, our editor, who we we love both of them very much. Who, yeah, thank who, you guys so much. Um, all right. So uh, this book, you know, obviously it was written before this uh, pandemic that we are in, uh, but it speaks very directly to some parts of the pandemic and it just speaks generally to the 
the new political situation that we are in, the kind of uh, post Bernie, not post Bernie, but but you know, uh, before Bernie and after Bernie moment. Uh, you know, Ber- life with Bernie on the national stage and life without Bernie on the national stage. But Bernie is and on the national stage. What are you talking about? Bernie's that's on what the I'm national saying. stage. What I mean is that the, he's entered the national stage, like the, life oh, after oh, his oh, entrance. Oh, you don't mean, yeah, stage. you mean after the, his entrance, right? Yes, You're not, you don't exactly. mean after his exit, because I was I was about to get really mad at you, but uh, no, Bernie's not going anywhere. Wrong. Okay, good. Bernie is not going anywhere. Okay, you're not. Uh, right. So we start the book. I think the first words of the book are that uh, Bernie changed everything. Uh, and change everything in terms of like what's possible in American politics. And I think it's important to, before we go anywhere else, just establish that as a fact, because I think a lot of people, maybe in particular younger people who, you know, haven't been politically, you know, sentient for a while, uh, but also other people who just, you know, are used to this new normal that we have where socialism is on the national stage, where we have people who are, you know, self-proclaimed democratic socialists running for president and winning races in the house and winning races for city council and cities and you know up and down the chain you know socialism is in our our body politic in a way that it wasn't uh you know four or five years ago so let's just start with there like what is the change environment that we're in now i think the change in the environment is that it seems completely possible to not just have a critique of capitalism which is something that you know it, that was definitely off limits. It was off the table um, post in the in the sort of like era after the ascendance to prominence of neoliberalism in the era after Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative right in the UK and after um, Reagan instituted neoliberal policies with such thoroughness that it seemed like an alternative wasn't possible in the United States either. There were decades during which it wasn't really possible to consider any other type of organization of society besides capitalism. Um, The best you were meant to hope for was uh, to be able to compete on the market well enough to be able to secure a little bit of dignity for yourself and your family. Um, And that sort of started to change with Occupy. I mean, the the last, the Great Recession changed a lot of this. It seemed like uh, the, a real emperor wears no clothes moment for a lot of people. But still, what wasn't, what was missing was the idea that we could not just have a critique of capitalism, but we could have a positive political vision to replace to replace the status quo. And that is what has fundamentally changed since Bernie entered the national stage, as you put it, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I am someone who has been a socialist of one kind or another for half my life, a little over a decade and a half. And I had decided to become a socialist, a leftist, an anti-capitalist. And I decided that knowing, thinking or thinking that I knew that my politics would never have a mainstream resonance that I, you know, I was a socialist because it was the right thing and I believed in the politics, but uh, the best I could hope for was to sort of uh, advocate for my politics. You know, that that's like a, a private thing. Like I'm just, I'm a socialist, but that, you know, the American public is never going to go for this socialism stuff for all the reasons that we all, we've all been told why Americans don't go for socialism. And so uh, I was just going to be condemned to, political marginalization for the rest of my life, I would soldier on because I believed it was the right thing to do. Uh, but it would it would never actually catch on. And lo and behold, we've found out that, that is not true. And then the, the that was my experience, which is true for I think a lot of leftists. And you had kind of other side of that experience personally, which was that you became a socialist through the Bernie campaign, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was just, you know, everybody has very complicated story and I feel like there are many different starting points to my political story. Just the other day I was actually looking into, I was researching for an article and I was researching the demolition of public housing in New Orleans post-Hurricane Katrina and I came across 
a an article about it, a photograph of myself 12 years ago at a protest in New Orleans, which I had done when I was a freshman in college, mainly because I had encountered a group of older student radicals who I thought were really cool. And they were like, we should go do this thing. And I like, had really did not understand what was going on. And I was like, definitely, let's go. Um, but it was actually like a, a very formative political experience for me. You know, I got down there and, and it, I realized when I was there, when I was standing in front of these public housing projects that these buildings were actually unscathed. Like they were, they were fine compared to all the other buildings in New Orleans, which had been, or certain parts of New Orleans, which had been reduced to rubble splinters, really, because they were all made of wood. These buildings were very structurally sound. Um, and actually, in fact, what was happening was that the city wanted to um, eliminate them and replace them with a smaller scale public housing system and have fewer public housing residents, more people on um, vouchers for private housing, you know, just to sort of privatize the entire system. Okay, this is a very long story. The reason I'm telling you this story is because it's like there were many different times in my life when I was presented uh, with the reality that the system that we live in, where the maximization of profit leads to a sort of cascading, that that's the sort of driving compulsion of everything. And then it leads to a cascading sort of domino effect where you also end up with austerity being implemented in the public sector. And say, for example, this leads to vast numbers of poor black people being um, driven from the city that they call home and not being allowed to come back because the homes that they knew, which were provided by the state and were the only things that they could afford, are literally just being shuttered in their absence, right? This is like a purge of the poor. I had seen examples like this over and over. There was Hurricane Katrina, there was the Great Recession, there was, you know, the war in Iraq, you know, there were many different moments where it was obvious to me, I was participated in Occupy, it was obvious to me that the status quo was not acceptable. But what was missing was the idea that you could, that I could affiliate myself with a movement that was fighting for an alternative and that it wasn't just a pipe dream. It could actually be a real thing that I did with my own life, right? And I had never even asked. I was, I was aware of Jacobin for a couple of years before Bernie ran for president the first time. And I occasionally would read articles and be like, I agree with this. But I never even asked myself the question, like, am I a socialist? And I feel like that's what Bernie did for a whole generation of young uh, sort of pseudo radicals, right? It's like pose the question, which side are you actually on? It's time to pick a side. And not just that you, you know, that there is a thing called socialism that is out there, not just that there are bad things happening in the world, like the destruction of this public housing complex unnecessarily in New Orleans that you mentioned, but that there is a movement of socialists that if you join it, it's like a credible political alternative like you join it and you can actually change the world like you won't just be consigned to total marginalization uh that this is a uh relevant and and you know robust and and important and uh, movement and ideology that you can join with other people and you can actually have an impact on the world and that is a that is a new <laughs> development in recent history and one uh that we should be uh, frankly uh, very glad for and in the first chapter after the introduction of the book, uh, that's our sort of lone chapter that focuses on uh, Bernie Sanders. And the chapter is kind of a retelling of Bernie's life mixed in with a discussion of what else was going on uh, in the sort of movement of history, uh, you know, before he came on under the scene. The lead up to his life, you know, we talk about uh, you know, Eugene Debs and, and you know, we mentioned like Vito Marcantonio, the Harlem uh, socialist congressman who was in office a few years or years before and during uh, Bernie's birth a few miles away in Brooklyn. Uh, and then, you know, we talk about Bernie and how he's both the product of the forces of history, I guess you could say. He's a product of his upbringing, which people who are listening to this are probably familiar with, you know, Jewish immigrant parents who uh, are not totally impoverished, but really did struggle to get through life and lived in a rent stabilized apartment. And, uh, you know, life was a struggle, a real struggle for them. Uh, and he goes off to college and he gets involved in two movements that become really central to how he ends up living the rest of his life. Right. And one is the civil rights, civil rights movement, which is of course the most important movement that was going on, uh, during, his uh, time as a, uh, a 
the time as a college student and also arguably the most important social movement in American history. Uh, and two, the socialist movement through the Young People's Socialist League, which gives him a way of seeing the world. He gives him a basic socialist political education that even though he never joins another socialist organization after that time, after his membership in Yipsel, uh, it clearly gives him the basics of how the, he sees the world functioning and like who your friends are, who your enemies are, how you make social change, how you don't make social change. Uh, and so in his like college years and his early 20s, I would say he's, he's sort of a product of these things, which are very much of the historical moment, especially the civil rights movement. Um, but then he after that moment, he kind of stands outside of the tides of history uh, in a way. Right. He becomes uh, you know, he, he, he's had these formative experiences and he is holding on to them and he is refusing, stubbornly refusing in what may be the, you know, uh, case study of the most stubborn individual in all of American history, like sticks to this, this politics and this way of seeing in the world and refuses to budge on any of it, despite the fact that he is living through the end of history that we were just discussing, you know, in the intro. Uh, and, Thank God for that, because that uh, you know he's he's in the wilderness for decades, but it leads us to the political moment that we're currently in, where we see this rejuvenation of socialism. I one this is a detail that you actually noticed and that we put in the book that I really like is that Bernie is sort of a man of his time in many ways. I mean, like you said, he was sort of his political ideology was uh, forged in the flames of the the sort of the tail end of the socialist movement before it was, you know, crushed. Now it has, of course, reemerged. But um, he was the sort of one of the last to be um, brought in and educated in the socialist movement when it was like not completely marginal and also the civil rights movement. But he's also kind of out of step with history in a way. And this is the detail that I liked that you brought up, which is that he actually... Um, left Chicago and went to Vermont um, in the very late 60s, right? Like 69, maybe 70. Or 70, and maybe, I think. It was maybe Not 70. Sure. So, but in any case, this was actually a time when in the cities, which were the locus of um, young radical leftist activity, things were starting to get a little weird. And Bernie kind of jumped ship before things like took a turn for the worse um, and ended up doing a base, basically a facsimile, an early a prototype of what would eventually become the back to the land movement, which all those people who stayed in the cities when things got really weird, ended up leaving the cities to go do the back to the land thing like after him. And by the time they all moved out to places like Vermont or whatever, Northern California to do that, Bernie was kind of a step ahead of them and had decided to go into politics. It's just funny to think about how he's like, he's not like, he's really not actually following what other people are doing. He's actually, um, kind of one step ahead and maybe also like dodging bullets a little bit left and right. And, you know, once he decides to go into politics, he basically stays stuck in um, for the rest of his life. And we're, we're very grateful for that. And I think one one thing, this is another thing that you, you phrased it as, uh, or a formulation that perhaps we came up with together, I don't even remember at this point, is that there were subjective and objective factors that were interplaying and interweaving with each other, like Bernie's unique stubbornness and his uniquely being both of his time and out of step with history. Also, just there are just objective factors, like the changes in political economy and the sort of um, creation of new political possibilities. And he happened to have stuck it out long enough to have been able to provide electoral leadership in a moment when it was possible. Right. And uh, before we continue that conversation, 1968, we have it in the book, Megan, <laughs> page 14. Nice. <laughs> That's when he moved to Vermont. <laughs> nice. um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that is what Marxism is all about, is about, you know, it, it, this comes up a lot in discussions about Bernie and his significance on the left. Is the moment that we're in a product of the objective factors of you know, economy and our politics and society, uh, or is it because of the subjective will of one Bernard Sanders? And Marxists know that history is produced by both, like interacting with each other, that it's, it's obviously we would not have a Bernie Sanders, uh, two Bernie Sanders campaigns without all of the objective factors that we know, you know, the widespread immiseration of huge numbers of the population, you know, people being crushed by student debt and medical debt and widespread inequality and all of the rest of it. Bernie's campaign would, he would have stayed in the wilderness if all of that stuff had not worsened and worsened up until 2016. 
Um, but it also is a subjective factor. I don't think that we would have had the rejuvenation of the socialist movement that we have seen without Bernie Sanders himself. Bernie Sanders, the individual running as a democratic socialist, it, so much of what has come out of the last few years is is uh, because he did that. And we see in situations in the past, like in Occupy, right? Like Occupy was a product of the objective forces of history, obviously, but because anarchism was dominant and there, there was not a, there was not a uh, rejuvenation of the socialist movement that came out of Occupy. There was certainly new left-wing energy, but there was not a reborn socialist movement in the way that there was after Bernie's first uh, run. So I just think that that stuff is really important for us to talk about and to get right about how we ended up where we are uh, today. So uh, we, the chapter on Bernie, that, that's our only chapter that is really on Bernie, and then everything else is basically the, the bigger than Bernie stuff. Um, and we kind of, the rest of the book is on basically two subjects. One, the the, the bigger movement, you know, Bernie's slogan for his 20, 2020 campaign is not me, us. And so we're taught, the book is about how we build that, that us, uh, that thing, that movement that's bigger than Bernie. And we, we address it in basically two tracks. One is through the electoral track. Uh, and then the other is through a kind of grassroots movement, you know, uh, labor movement, environmental movement, affordable housing, all, all the rest of the sort of bottom-up grassroots movement stuff, uh, and the interplay between those two, because obviously they're not uh, distinct phenomena. So uh, let's start with the electoral stuff. You, we have a chapter that is on uh, the kind of like theoretical framework for how we should do elections as socialists. So can you lay out the kind of theory we advance in, in that chapter? Yeah, I mean, the theory is is basically it's we're trying to flesh out something that people say a lot. I mean, it's kind of it's almost like a catechism on the left, which is that um, if you we, we're not just running because we want our people to win, we're also running to build movements, right? We want movement pol politicians. I don't think that that's a completely uh, unique perspective. And I think that's part of the, the people. People get that. That's part of why Bernie's slogan, not me, us, really resonated with people. It's because a lot of people already understand that they're not going to elect their way into a better world, that we need to have some kind of movement pressure and we need to build movements on the ground. Um, so we started from that point and we tried to actually flesh out what that looks like and we advanced a theory of what we are calling class struggle elections it's um it's not something that we came up with by ourselves we came up with it you know in concert with other people who are in democratic socialists of america with us and that in fact uh there was a resolution passed at um dsa's convention last summer um that was like called like class struggle elections or something like that. Um, and it was democratically passed by the organization. But the theory that we we tried to put a finer point on what it actually looks like, and we put three criteria down on, on paper. The first is that a class struggle candidate, we're just going to start talking about candidates first and not you know people who are in office yet, but a class struggle candidate is using their campaign to raise the expectations of ordinary people for what they deserve from society or what they might be able to expect from society. Um, a perfect example of that would be Bernie Sanders using both of his presidential campaigns to inject new possibilities into the American political mainstream. And the best example of that is Medicare for All, which if you recall, when he ran against Hillary Clinton, I know this is a cliche, now everybody knows this, but she did in fact say that single payer will never ever come to pass. It's a pony. It's a promising pony. Yeah, and uh, she said something else about free chocolate milk. I don't know. She's so condescending sometimes about this stuff. Um, and and while she remains condescending about it, actually, most of the Democratic <laughs> Party, most of the Democratic Party actually hasn't. They've realized that they needed to change their change their um, attitude so that they don't get left behind. That doesn't mean that they've embraced Medicare for all. It means that they've vacillated on it or they've found ways to pretend to support the idea while also changing its fundamental meaning and so on. So the first one is raising expectations. Um, and you, just real quick, if I can interject, you, you had the idea to include the, uh, the quote that better summarizes this than anything else, which is the quote from AOC at the Queen's right. rally for Bernie which is when she says, uh, when she was, talks about working as a waitress and it was a bartender and she says like, at that time I did not have health care, and I did not think that I deserved health care. And it was the Bernie Sanders campaign that convinced me that actually I did deserve health care. This was 
I think people don't ha don't necessarily appreciate how much has changed. Sometimes if you are advocating for Medicare for all, you will experience somebody saying back to you online or in person, um, you know, if you want if you want good health care, you should go get a job that gives you good health care. And then you work backward from there with them. And you're like, how would one get one this kind of job? Oh, you need education. How would one get this kind of education if X, Y, Z, right? Um and it's much it's much rarer to have that conversation with somebody now than it used to be. That used to be the dominant frame of thinking about everything. And now, at the very least, it's a dialogue, right? Um, so that's one, raising expectations. Uh, the second one is naming class enemies. And I think this is really important because a lot of – we're talking about a – yes, it's polarizing. Yes, we're talking about, you know – drawing lines in the sand and asking people which side are you on, but it's also unifying because we're talking about unifying disparate sectors of the vast majority of society with each other across lines of difference against the tiny minority who they are most different from. So we shouldn't, yes, it's polarizing, but yes, it's also unifying. It's a very specific dynamic and it's one that you're not going to see re re reflected in liberal politics because liberal politics are typically about um, a fake unity, like a sort of like a uh, we're going to un unite everybody. The Democratic Party is the party of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and people who are getting their claims denied by Blue Cross well, Blue Shield. Well, and also the idea that like, e I mean, everybody wants what's best for everybody, right? Right, right. And we're going like, to find no, solutions. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to find solutions that make everybody happy. And we're not going to discriminate against people on the basis of their um, income, whether it be large or small, right? <laughs> These kinds of ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous um, appeals to unity across lines of real difference. And then the Republican Party tends to trade in a very harsh type of uh, division, uh, divisiveness, uh, specifically cultural divisiveness, you know, uh, racial divisiveness, uh, division on the basis of your uh, uh, nationality, um, you know, sexuality or gender presentation. Um, you know, these are all these are the kinds of things that Republicans are trying to drive a wedge between people. What we're talking about is a totally different um, approach, which is that we're uniting people against the people that they're most different from. So that's the second one. And then the third one is just leaving movements stronger than you found them. It's sort of like the principle when you go into the woods and you have to, you know, leave it cleaner than you found it. If you see a piece of, a piece of trash, pick it up. If that's the idea. That's the sort of animating principle behind a class struggle campaign is the idea that movements should be stronger for the uh, campaign itself having happened. So that's. That's the theoretical section. Uh, and then we have a, a chapter that, to my knowledge, nobody has, I mean, it's far from a comprehensive overview of everything that's happened with uh, Democratic Socialists of America members in electoral politics over the last couple of years. But we do collect uh, some highlights. Uh, and we, you know, it's not just like, oh, rah, rah, we won an election here. It's talking about what were the dynamics in three different cities that uh, led to victory or even in the description of a loss, how did that loss actually help us build exactly what you're talking about, the you know, a broader social movement? So uh, we have uh, case studies on electoral victories by socialists in Chicago, in the East Bay of California, and in New York. You know, of course, you live in the East Bay. I live in Chicago. Uh, and then I also wrote the section on New York, uh, where there's been some of the most exciting electoral stuff happening uh, around the country. Um, in the, I'll start with the New York example, I guess. Uh, in New York, there there's a very small total number of socialists who have won elected office in New York. It's important to say, and that's true anywhere you look. I mean, like even in, in the House, I know we're all so excited that Rashida Tlaib and AOC are both members of DSA and they were elected to the House, but they are two people out of over 400 in the House. So they are a hyper minority in the House. And yet that hyper minority has been able to accomplish uh, a great deal. And uh, we talk about in the New York section how AOC's election, how the election of Julia Salazar to the New York State Senate and the general engagement of the New York City Democratic Socialists of America all came together to uh, be part of a broader movement of other working class forces and progressive forces, the majority of whom were not self-described socialists, uh, you know, community groups like 
uh, you know, New York Communities for Change and other, you know, all of the other uh, players that are, that are uh, involved in progressive politics. Um, they, the DSA and the DSA elected officials joined that broader working class progressive coalition to win a whole suite of new uh, measures designed to uh, protect and expand affordable housing in New York City. And the same is true in Chicago. I mean, the way that half a dozen city council members in Chicago who are members of the Democratic Socialists of America were elected is because they were part of that broader movement. They brought something unique to the table, uh, but in both places, uh, you had a broader movement that was willing to work uh, with uh, people who are self-described socialists. They weren't scared of that. Uh, and playing as actors in, in part of a broader working class coalition uh, enabled real, us to put real victories on the board. And in the Chicago case, uh, as, as folks probably know, Chicago is a city whose politics have been transformed by uh, the Chicago Teachers Union, their leadership being taken over by a group of radicals, uh, incidentally or not incidentally, uh, uh, socialists were a very important part of doing that in 2010. I wrote a whole book called Strike for America about that takeover. So socialists, along with other you know, working class militants who are part of the militant minority, as we call it, um, took over a union, made it more democratic, made it more militant, made it fight on behalf of the entire Chicago working class, went on strike in 2012 and won, and transformed politics in the city. Uh, and then in that transformed landscape, socialists were able to play an important role uh, alongside that broader social movement. So that's the case in both um, Chicago and in New York. It's like a description of, it's, it's not just like, Socialists win, and then socialists do good things. It's it's a it's a complex story about the interplay between socialists and between the DSA and between uh, you know people being rank and file uh, teachers or you know just uh, average DSA activists joining with elected officials uh, in a broader socialist and working class movement and winning things together. And it's a really it, it's. Nobody else really tells the, the story, as far as I know, uh, of that of how that interplay has worked uh, in those two cities. But that is how socialists have been able to make victories, to win victories over the last couple of years in those two cities. Yeah. And then I wrote the section on East Bay because I live here in the East Bay. I live in Berkeley. Berkeley is very next, right next to Oakland. They're arbitrarily divided uh, by a jagged line from each other. Um and well, I should also point out that the reason that we did these three cities is because you live in Chicago and I live in the East Bay and New York has been the nexus of a lot of very important electoral activity. And so we wanted to make sure that we were covering things that we knew and could speak to and also things that were really important. But DSA, there are DSA chapters all over the country and they are doing all kinds of uh, different things, and we didn't want to, we don't want to shortchange anybody. But uh, there are, there are other stories besides these three stories. But we think, and we do think that the, the dynamics in these large blue cities are quite different than being in a socialist organization in a s small town or a small city or a red state or so on and so forth. Um, but we also think that socialists have had pretty phenomenal success in these particular types of like blue urban environments, in part because it's possible to draw out contradictions with the Democratic Party. It's like when you're in a I grew up in, in uh, you know, in a red state. So when you're when you're living in a place like that, the Democrats are the good guys because the Republicans are right there and they are really, really bad. And it's very hard to convince people that um, they should actually side with the socialists instead. So the dynamics are quite different. Um, and there's a lot of room for people to tell stories about uh, what it looks like to organize in those places as well. So that's just a little caveat. And I want to say about why why another reason we included the story of what happened in the East Bay is because we wanted to emphasize to people that it's okay to lose. Um, you can win while you're losing. You shouldn't be afraid to mount insurgent campaigns that are ultimately unsuccessful. A lot of them will be. I mean, honestly, most of them probably yeah. will be. Spoiler, yeah, we're, we're going to keep <laughs> losing more than we win. Yeah. And in the East Bay, we launched uh, uh, an enormous, uh, very labor intensive and very exciting campaign for uh, state assembly. Um, this was a East Bay DSA member, Javanka Beckles, who was running for state assembly. She had sat on city council 
in a city called Richmond, which is just north of Berkeley. It's a working class, mostly POC city north of Berkeley. It's the home of uh, a Chevron refinery, which is the largest employer in the city of Richmond and also the worst polluter in the city of Richmond. And Javanka, who is a queer, black, and Latina, lesbian, um, working class, uh, union member, social worker, had been sitting on the city council for eight years battling Chevron um, and doing things like getting them to stop uh, giving children asthma and um, extracting taxes from them to have social programs. And so she decided to run for state assembly. East Bay DSA built a phenomenal, very large, uh, very intensive boots on the ground campaign for her. And ultimately, we lost, uh, I would say pretty narrowly, to someone named Buffy Wicks, who was parachuted in specifically for this purpose, who had been... Every time you talk about Buffy Wicks, I see you, I see the blood, like, rushing <laughs> Yeah, Mike and I are on, like, and I are Buffy on Wicks, Zoom right let now. Let me tell you something about <laughs> Buffy fucking Wicks. Look, here's the thing about Buffy Wicks, just go to buffywicks.money. <laughs> this is a this is a website that East Bay DSA built during the campaign, and it is still live, and we're not taking it down. So you go there, and you go you go see what you think about Buffy Wicks. And, and I'll give you another tidbit. She, she worked for the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016 and in the, in California and was given the nickname Buffy the Bernie Slayer. So just dwell on that. So ultimately, she defeated us. She defeated Javanka. Um, it didn't feel great. I mean, felt pretty bad. And also, we had run a very intensive campaign that had built up our own operations in East Bay DSA. It had accelerated our internal capacity building in a way that I can I cannot I can't describe to you. Like it was the most coordinated thing we'd ever done. It had a lot of energy and enthusiasm. There were so many people involved in it. We learned a ton of skills. We grew a lot of confidence. And so when the Oakland teachers went on strike a few months later, our chapter was really strong and we were able to immediately spring into action to do solidarity work for the Oakland teachers. Um, we had infrastructure from the campaign that we just didn't disassemble and we were able to apply it directly to a labor solidarity struggle. And East Bay DSA was definitely the most active uh, community presence at all of the picket lines. Um, we did things like organizing food for teachers who were on strike. We were up at 6.30 every morning driving out to beef up picket lines. We were getting signals from the union about which picket lines were weak and needed socialists to drive out in cars that we called flying squadrons. Um, this was a reference to an old 1930s labor tactic. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was cool. It was an exciting, very heady time and we helped strengthen the strike effort. And I think that the moral of that story is that the effort that we put in to get Javanka elected did not go to waste, even though Javanka didn't get elected, actually. It could have if we had just, you know, pouted and gone home. Um, but instead, we saw it as a constituent part of a larger struggle anyway. And so there was no choice that we were not going to disassemble what we had just built. We were going to apply it somewhere else, somewhere non-electoral. And now we're pivoting back again because we're looking at potentially coming out of the um, teacher strike, uh, doing another sort of electoral push to get good people on the school board. So, you know, you see it sort of weaving with, in concert with OEA, DSA and OEA. So you see it sort of weaving in between electoral and non-electoral. Right. So that chapter, as I said, is an overview of, you know, we, we attempt to give an overview of the nuances of what makes for good uh, socialist electoral campaigning um, and talking about the ins and outs of these three places, not as a complete overview of, uh, of all that the DSA has done electorally, but as just three case studies of, of things that have gone pretty well. And I guess we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because we keep mentioning DSA, uh, but we haven't actually discussed, you know, DSA and what it is and why it's important. Um, you know, both of you and I are members um, and we've had our, the most formative political experiences coming through DSA. And it is not the only, you know, organization to be a part of the, uh, the us part of the not me us, you know, the, the broad social movement, the broad, the broad uh, Bernie movement coming out of Bernie's uh, campaigns. But we think that it has a pretty important role to play uh, in, in politics, you know, generally speaking. 
Uh, so why don't we just give the basic pitch? I mean, why why DSA? What's so important about it? And maybe even for listeners, I'm, I assume a lot of the listeners will be familiar with it, but some probably won't. So, you know, what what is DSA and and what's what are the what do we do and how has it been reshaped from Bernie's campaign and, and all the rest of it? Give us give us the rundown on DSA. Rundown on DSA. So DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, was a socialist organization that existed prior to Bernie Sanders' 2016 uh, run for the presidency, but it was radically remade in starting in 2016. So I was a part of the first wave of people who joined because of that. And I went to the first meeting of my local chapter right after Trump won. And it was like a bunch of people who were in their 70s. And by a bunch, I mean like eight or nine. And then like you know, they were outnumbered by brand new people who were my age at that time. I think I was like 20, I don't know, late, tw- late 20s. Um, and they were like, who are you? Where did you come from? Um, we were like, we're the new p- socialists now. And they were like, great, we've been waiting for decades for you. Please have the keys to our chapter. Um, we are tired. Please take over. Um, and so DSA has ballooned in size. I mean, it's, I think it's 10 times the size that it was in 2016. And um, it is the largest socialist organization in half a century in the United States. It has about 60,000 members, and it is dedicated to doing all of the stuff that a socialist organization might do. So different chapters do that differently, but we have national convention that is democratically structured, and then different chapters have democratic structures themselves, um, and people decide together what they want to do. And you know, there's a large emphasis on electoral politics, but also also on uh, local housing struggles uh, or state housing struggles, also on environmental stuff and, and a, a serious emphasis on labor as well. And it all there's also an emphasis on political education, which I think is really important because that's what you get from a socialist organization that you're not going to get from another issue based or like if you want to do environmental stuff, there are environmental groups for you to join. But the reason you would join DSA is because you understand that the environmental issues you care about are connected intimately to the capitalist economy and to the other um issues that are being taken up by DSA and because you are interested in doing political education to further understand that and because you identify as a socialist and you want to continue to build up your own capacities as a socialist to analyze and understand and ultimately to act in the world. Um, Those are all the reasons why people have joined DSA and those are the those are the reasons why it's nourishing to people like us. And then I would add as a final note that DSA is a membership organization. The the fact that it's democratic is really important for a number of reasons. One, it's not a nonprofit. It's not being run by a board of directors or whatever. You don't have a boss to answer to. Um, And that is important because people can decide on their own what to do and without the sort of conservatizing forces that are being imposed on um, NGOs. Uh, which have to, you know, collect money in order to, faci- you know, we collect dues from our, from ourselves and then we elect ourselves to be in charge of stuff periodically, right? Um, and the other thing is that we're also practicing governance because we're a democratic organization. And I have learned so much from just being a person who participates in these large democratic assemblies. Um, for example, when I was in Nevada, I was tasked with doing some being a uh, in charge of a precinct and I was terrified I was there for the Bernie Sanders campaign I was terrified to do it I was like I'm not an expert don't put me in charge of stuff and then when I got in the room I was like oh yeah I know how this works this is this, for the caucus this is like, you're talking about this was for the Nevada caucuses that I was just yeah. at yeah sorry um I was impressed by how much I had learned I mean I was honestly <laughs> like like I, I felt Damn, like I, oh wow okay uh, yeah you're like <laughs> I walked in I walked in terrified and then, and then like within you know half an hour I was just like you yahoos don't know how to run one of these things you know stomping around um, so I think that the democratic political education that you get in DSA really builds your confidence which is important because the people who are running the show are in fact morons and you need to understand that in order to go toe to toe with them you need to have confidence so that's good. And so, uh, you know, spoiler, the book the book is a bit of a book length commercial for people to join DSA because we think that it is involved. It's at the center of a lot of the, the most important stuff happening 
in American politics right now. And uh, it's it's transformed our lives and, and, and we love it. Um, we're, we're kind of going backwards here, but uh, through the kind of political education, socialist Marxist political education that you're talking about that we get through the DSA, that, that, that members get through the DSA, um, you know, that, that has been obviously central to how we have come up with the electoral strategy that we were just talking about. And central to that strategy is how we engage with the Democratic Party. We're running a, a little low on time here, but maybe you could briefly go over uh, our sections on the, the Democratic Party and how we should approach that party as uh, socialists who uh, maybe recognize that there is something deeply wrong with that party, but also recognize that uh, it gives us some opportunity that we might not have operating totally outside of it. Yeah, I mean, there's saying that there's something deeply wrong with the Democratic Party is like kind of an understatement, honestly. I think that right now, for example, um, in the what appears to be a likely uh, Bernie Sanders defeat at the hands of uh, Joe Biden, though that is not certain. I just want to put it out there that honestly, we have no idea what's going to happen next. But it does, you know, Joe's ahead and he's got like a, a serious, you know, majority to contend with of delegates. And a lot of people are talking about splitting with the Democratic Party because they're absolutely sick of it. And their their instinct is completely correct and they're completely right. That was the exact same thing that drove me to DSA meetings. Um well, also, Bernie Sanders has been an independent his entire career. Mm-hmm. And we have quotes from him from his first memoir talking about, like, uh, you know, quoting the Labor Party, the, the now defunct U.S. Labor Party slogan about the bosses have two parties. We need one of our own. And mm-hmm. Bernie's like, oh, sounds good. <laughs> right. right. Uh, so, you know, he, he, he himself uh, acknowledges something deeply wrong with the Democratic Party. Right. And and I think, like, we... A lot of people, I think, maybe they just say, okay, there's something, the Democratic Party is is unrehabilitatable, which is a word that I just came up with. Um, and so and so we, we got to go start a party of our own. But it's unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. I, I, I honestly wish that it were, because I'm, I'm completely ready to bolt. You know, I don't want to share a party with... Um, you know, half of the half of the capitalist class is in the Democratic Party. The capitalist class is split relatively evenly between the Democratic and Republican parties, and so is the voting portion of the working class electorate uh, split relatively evenly between those parties as well. It's a very cozy situation for the capitalists, and it's a terrible situation for working class struggle. And we should all want it to change as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, it appears that in order to change that. What seems at first to be the right thing to do, to go start a party of our own, is actually not quite so simple. A third party not only is boxed out by... Pardon me, by the incredible, um, incredibly strict rules around uh, maintaining a ballot line in United States electoral politics, but also by the kind of hegemony of the Republican and Democratic Party, which is strengthened by the spoiler effect problem, which is what happens when you have third party runs. Um, Ralph Nader, obviously, uh, his his run for uh, president actually, if anything, kind of uh, concretized that for people, which is a real a real problem that we have to contend with. Um, essentially, what I'm saying is that, as our friend Robbie Nelson puts it, it's not a party until there's a crowd, and unless you're can unless you have built a crowd to follow you into a new party, your party is going to be crushed. And that's going to be extremely demoralizing. It's going to be a, a waste of your energy. And we just can't, strategically, that's not something that we can do at this exact moment, I don't think. Um, so instead, what we're advocating for is some kind of strategy to help us build a base, a working class base. I would say um, <clears throat> a large portion of that should be drawn from the Democratic Party's current base. A lo- uh, maybe perhaps a small portion of it could be drawn from the Republican Party's working class base, which it doesn't deserve. And then we also want to bring in people who are not politically activated. The most important political party in the United States, as some people say, is non-voting, the party of non-voters. If we were a- able uh, to create a situation where um, we could pull in enough of those three types of people into a new formation so that it could be competitive with the Republican and Democratic parties, then we would be on good footing. But we can't simply create a party out of thin air and then build it and hope that people will come. 
Instead, we have to reverse engineer it. We have to work backward. We have to build the base, a class conscious base that is actively interested in being a part of a formation of a political formation that advocates for working class people against the capitalist class and that understands that the interests of those two groups are fundamentally at odds with each other. So how do we do that? Our theory, and this is a theory that you and I draw from the work of others, uh, specifically Eric Blanc, who has, I think, coined this term, um, is that we will have what is called a dirty break, which is that we get dirty in the Democratic Party, we dirty ourselves by affiliation with them while we are also heightening contradictions, agitating, running the kinds of class struggle uh, campaigns that I was talking about earlier, building the kinds of movements that we've been talking about in our examples, and use that process to build the base that we need to ultimately be able to create a successful break from the Democratic Party. Because it's not just that we want a break, we want a successful break. Yes, that is an idea that we, as uh, regular Jacobin readers will probably know, have uh, taken from Eric Blanc, as well as uh, Seth Ackerman, the executive editor of, of Jacobin, and his piece, Blueprint for a New Party. Uh, I guess to sort of summarize, uh, we're confronted with this situation in which both parties are fundamentally capitalist parties, but one party, the Democrats, is one that has, as a part of its coalition, the working class, you know, organized labor, feminists, environmentalists, uh, racial justice advocates, etc. And those are the people who we think belong in a, an actual working class party, uh, not this uh, shitty one that we're stuck with, the, the Democrats. And so we want to move towards there eventually. Um, but the 20th century, 21st century is uh, littered with examples of uh, people trying to do that, especially like the second half of the 20th century. Leftists trying to create such a party and failing because of the structural barriers that we're up against. And so the whole argument of the dirty break is, you know, as you said, get, get dirty, get involved with the party, but do so in such a way that kind of uh, heightens the contradictions within the party and you know, can help show the people who are the you know union members and uh civil rights activists and feminist environmentalists that actually that this is not their party that they uh should not uh think of it as their party uh, it is the party of of the capitalist class and the bernie sanders campaign i think has shown the fruits that can come out of that dirty break strategy because you know bernie most of bernie's rhetoric has been around you know i want to move the democratic party to the left what is sometimes called the realignment strategy where you, you want to drive out the reactionary elements of the party and the capitalist elements of the party and, and make it a true workers party. You know, we can have debates about whether or not that is possible within the confines of the Democratic Party. But I think that Bernie's campaigning over the last four years has shown that if we're, you know, his campaigning has helped open people's eyes to the reality of how much the Democratic Party fucking sucks. They're terrible. Uh, they are moving heaven and earth, literally as we record this podcast, to try to smash the candidacy of somebody who uh, is saying that we all need uh, health care that's free at the point of use, that people shouldn't uh, be going bankrupt over medical bills, that people shouldn't be going, uh, be put tens of thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for going to school. Uh, we shouldn't be waging imperialist wars around the world. Like making those basic points, this party has moved heaven and earth to try to destroy his campaign and his candidacy and instead is propping up a corpse that is Joe Biden, uh, a man who can barely speak a coherent sentence at this point. Um, they would rather put up a candidate like that uh, against Donald Trump with the likelihood that that corpse will lose rather than see Bernie Sanders be that party's uh, candidate. And I think people who are observing this and who are taking part in this election uh, are, are having their eyes opened to the real problems with being in a, a coalition with uh, the Democrats based on the experience of this campaign. And, uh, you know, whether in a few years that results in us, you know, uh, being able to make this dirty break and form a party of our own, or whether that results somehow by some <laughs> miracle uh, that we get a, you know, a, a President Bernie Sanders or a President AOC and all of the, you know, Nancy Pelosi's and Chuck Schumer's of the world are so aghast at this that they decide they have to flee the Democratic Party and create like a liberal Democrats type, you know, third party like they have in the United Kingdom, which is, uh, you know, is not, it's like, the, it is the third party in the sense of it not being one of the two major parties in the country. 
Maybe that could happen. But what, whatever's going to happen, it's through this route that we're on, uh, which is heightening those contradictions within the Democratic Party and uh, making average people see uh, the reality that the Democrats do really suck and they're really bad. Um, let, let's move on from the electoral piece uh, to that kind of grassroots uh, movement piece. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, we've already talked about the DSA and the kind of grassroots campaigns that DSA has been involved in beyond electoral campaigns. We have a whole chapter on the labor movement and the importance of the labor movement, which will probably be obvious to people who are familiar with socialists. But, you know, we, we think that the working class is uh, the primary uh, agent that can bring about change uh, in the capitalist society. And uh, unions are a really important way to make that kind of change happen for ways that we've already talked about. I mean, the Chicago Teachers Union changing the entire political landscape of the city of Chicago is a perfect example. Um, and we have we focus a lot in that section on socialist strategy within the labor movement. And we advocate for what's called the rank and file strategy, which is another thing that was passed at the 2019 DSA uh, convention as the as DSA's labor strategy. And it's a strategy that focus, focuses on uh, embedding socialists within uh, the working class uh, as it exists in the United States. And this is an important thing to mention because sometimes like liberals will attack DSA and say, well, your members are, you know, you guys are a bunch of college educated, you know, disproportionately white, like, blah, 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 uh, people who are, you know, you're not actual members of the working class. And that case is certainly, uh, you know, overstated. And I think a lot of our comrades of color and our, uh, you know, working class comrades would take real issue with being erased by those attacks. Uh, but it is true that on the whole, the, the organization, the socialist movement in the United States is not fully reflective of the, you know, of, of the working class as it exists in the United States. And the rank and file strategy is a strategy that is about changing that and is about putting uh, uh, socialists like, you know, embedding, as I said, so embedding socialists within the American working class and doing so within the labor movement as rank and file members of uh, unions, uh, as rank and file workers, to be active as rank and file workers. Um, and the argument, there, there are many arguments for why doing that is important. Uh, one, what, key one of which is that in the past, uh, many socialists, including the DSA, took as their work within the labor movement, trying to get members of the what is often called the union bureaucracy, you know, people who are staffers or elected leaders of unions to join uh, the DSA to become socialists. And nothing wrong with that. That is a good thing. Some of my best friends are uh, progressive <laughs> union bureaucrats. Uh, but we make the case that the real uh, the, uh, the the ability to use the the labor movement to its sort of full potential to to uh, to flex its its, its muscles uh, as as much as is possible uh, is through rank and file self activity within unions and rank and file activity as workers uh, and part of that has to do with the structural pressures that come to bear on the union bureaucracy when you are in the union. Bureaucracy. I mean, you need a bureaucracy to keep the lights on of your union, right? Uh, you need a union bureaucracy to administer health care and pension benefits in a country where we don't currently have public systems for those things. Um, but that also means that there are conservatizing pressures that come to bear on you. And so, for example, if uh, you, you know, are in a situation where workers might want to go on strike, use the ultimate weapon that, that uh, the working class has against the capitalists, uh, that those conservatizing pressures of the bureaucracy uh, lead that bureaucracy often to pull back and say, well, this is a little risky, maybe we shouldn't do this. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that uh, socialists who are rank and file workers within the, the, the labor movement can advocate for and can lead uh, those, kind of, uh, those kind of fights. Um, and so we, we sort of make a case for that. And we also have some profiles of uh, people within the DSA who have already started doing that. I think another piece of this um, is that, and by the way, Micah, you and I agree on almost everything in the whole world, except for wh why do you call it the DSA? 
DS, excuse me. Whatever. I like to go back and forth. But, you know, when you <laughs> say something is the DSA, you know, capital T, the DSA, it makes it sound more like important and this is, cool. This is, her this is heresy. <laughs> okay. So, in any case, I wanted to add to this that there's another part of this, which is uh, often referred to as bargaining for the common good or another, another way to people. There are different... Uh, there's different terminology people use for it. Another way to talk about it is social justice unionism or a so social unionism. Sometimes people just say that. Um, in any case, what it what it really refers to is the idea that um, union fights, that uh, f uh, labor struggles, uh, can and should be connected when possible to the f broader fights for. Uh, the working class. So an example, this is really easy, easy to do in the public sector, actually. So um, it's, it's not, it's not impossible to do in the private sector either. Um, and it's really easy to do in the public sector. So for example, when you saw teachers going on strike, um, they made the decision to made very explicitly say that they weren't just striking to raise their own pay because that leaves them open to accusations that they're being selfish, that they're actually jeopardizing their students um, or abandoning their students for their own selfish reasons. They should be doing this as a labor of love, et cetera. Um, and instead they're saying, we're going on strike. Not Our demands are not just for our own pay, but we're also demanding uh, smaller class sizes for our students. We're demanding more supports for our students and so on and so forth, better facilities and so on. Um, and really saying like, what's good for us as workers is what's good for our students. It's what good for, what's good for our students' families. It's what's good for society. And actually this is far from a new concept. This is actually the animating concept really of Marx's idea that the working class is the agent of revolutionary change, because as the saying goes, the cause of labor is the hope of the world. When the working class fights for itself, it manages to transform society in ways that are good for everybody except for the tiny minority who profit from the exploitation of the vast majority. And then honestly, if you want to get philosophical with it, it possibly it's good for those people too. I mean, they're going to have to lose their standard of living, but it's very, it's bad for your soul to live in a society full of suffering and to personally play a part in worsening that suffering. So the cause of labor is the hope of the world. And this is that this is the underlying idea behind behind social justice unionism, but it's also it's also just smart strategy because you are helping inoculate the public against the at attacks that are going to be ginned up by the boss and the press and, you know, the capitalist friendly politicians that are going to come your way. Uh, you're lazy, you're selfish, you're hurting us for your own personal gain and so on and so forth. That's always their playbook. So we, we, we advocate for this, for bargaining for the common good as well. Um, and I want to say that something just happened, which is really phenomenal. Like I said, it's totally possible to do this in the private sector, these GE workers that have just walked out to demand that the that GE factories that are apparently sitting idle currently be converted to produce ventilators to solve the ventilator shortage that we're having during the coronavirus crisis um, for the good of everyone, for the good of our society, is just a perfect example of seeing the sort of broader social purpose of labor struggle. Um, I wish that that had happened before the book was published because I would have liked to have written written about it in that section. But yeah, I just wanted to underscore that that's another important piece of, of that part of the book. Yeah, I think those GE workers didn't uh, walk out, but they are uh, waging a campaign to oh, that's great. convince their company to, to do this, especially because they're idled right now because they're not able to make the kind of products that they normally do uh, because nobody's buying stuff right now. Uh, and it's an important thing to n mention that it's not an accident that it is socialists historically who have advocated for exactly the kind of social movement unionism that uh, you're talking about, because we see uh, that need for uh, a unionism that's not just like a group of workers, you know, fighting for their own uh, needs and then saying, fuck everybody else. It is a uh, advocate, you know, you see the union as the body that can fight for everybody, that can fight for the entire working class, which, of course, is the vast majority of society. Um, so there's more on the labor section, but we're running a little long here. Uh, you'll have to read more about labor as well as, you know, uh, fighting for a Green New Deal and for affordable housing and all of the uh, fights that we know that are uh, extremely important uh, for us to be fighting right now. Uh I wanted to wrap up with the obvious uh, question of where we go from here. I mean, we're at a moment where, as we've said, it looks like uh, Bernie 
uh, is uh, he, he's certainly not the front runner of the presidential campaign. We don't know what's going to happen there. We also don't know what's going to happen with with Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> just every day brings a new uh, just I, I can't even watch the videos anymore. Like I, I have to stop them because I like I have a very hard time with like, you know, things that are that are that are just you have you have no schadenfreude micah it's incredible <laughs> you have the least schadenfreude of any human i've ever met well it, i can be forgiven because this should be teed up this election should be teed up for literally anyone to be able I mean, it would be better off if hillary clinton were running right now than joe biden against donald trump but anyway uh you know joe biden is is barely staggering uh, out he, he may he may or may not still be alive um, and and Bernie is certainly the underdog right now. I think he'll play a role in politics going forward, but it's looking less and less likely that he'll become the president. So I guess the question is where we go from here. What is the uh, next step? Given everything that we've uh, laid out, given the excitement that is around the Democratic Socialists of America, these new, the small but important number of elected officials that uh, we have who are socialists, uh, the you know way that uh, you know, labor militancy is kicking off, especially right now in the midst of the of the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, wh- what are the where do we where do we go from here? What what's next? Okay, I mean that's a huge question, and like I've never lived through a massive pandemic and economic shutdown before, so I don't really know what's happening. I think we're all just we're all just guessing at this point. But I will no, say, produ- our producer needs to strike that. We ha- we have the answers. They're okay, in this yeah, book. sorry, just we buy have the all book. The answers. <laughs> buy the all books there. in the book. If you want to know what happens next, just buy the book. No, I mean <laughs> it. In, you know, the book doesn't account for the situation that we've landed in. Um, you know, we have we've said before, there's uh, there's always another crisis. Right. I mean, capitalism is incredibly unstable. It, it is. It produces uh, crises in, in with increasing frequency. Um, and it actually each crisis is sort of a, typically a, p- a pretext for uh, the exacerbation of inequality Um you know, the muscling through of uh, more and more pieces of the neoliberal agenda, more austerity, more privatization. This is the sort of thesis of Naomi Klein's uh, shock doctrine. Um, But we are in an odd situation right now where we are faced with a crisis, uh, like many that we have seen before. And it's actually unclear at the moment. We know that the forces of neoliberalism are taking advantage of it in the exact way that one would predict. But there is also a much stronger left current in the United States than there has been in all of the previous iterations of this kind of thing, going back, stretching back, basically, certainly through the you know, like the middle decades of the 20th century, possibly going all the way back to the New Deal. We haven't seen something like this where a crisis is actually at least creating an ultimatum um, and that there it is possible to imagine that in resolution to this crisis, even though some capitalists are going to make out like bandits and certainly Trump is do, and his administration are doing their best to make sure that happens, that also there's a large appetite for um, the kinds of the implementation of the kinds of changes that would make it so that the time the next crisis hits, it doesn't just uh, it isn't just a house of cards that falls down at the sort of slightest disturbance, right? Um, and it seems like a lot of people are actually um, very loudly demanding an emergency implementation of Bernie Sanders' entire platform, um, which is bittersweet, I think, given the given the electoral scenario at the moment. But something that we have to push on and something that I think socialists have a unique role in pushing on. So where do we go next? I mean, I would say that there's the long term where we go next, which actually is described in uh, in in the book, I mean, we try to do our best to give people a sense of what we think should should happen, broadly speaking. But the short term, where we should go next is, frankly, we should try to have like a people's shock doctrine. We should try our hardest to make sure that the resolution that first of all, that people understand that the social and economic breakdown that we're experiencing right now is not actually caused by the novel coronavirus. It is caused by the structure of society that's not equipped to handle a massive pandemic. And two, to um, use it as a pretext to actually muscle through changes in the opposite direction of what you typically see happening in the event of a crisis and actually use it to implement things like Medicare for all, um, implement, um, you know, I mean, raise wages, uh, make sure that workers have protections, uh, preferably in the form of unions. 
and to you know eliminate the kind of debt that is uh, making people's personal finances so shaky and so unstable that that like I said, the slightest disturbance can cause absolute havoc and chaos. Uh, to intervene in the in housing prices, uh, ideally with the mass construction of public housing and the implementation of national rent control, so that people aren't living on the edge of homelessness if they are no longer able to receive a paycheck. Yeah, in, institute paid sick leave, make sure that people have adequate child care, you know, so on and so forth. These are the things that we've wanted the whole time. We need to do everything that is in, within our power to get a few of them out of this crisis. And I think that Bernie Sanders has a role to play in this because he hasn't gone anywhere. He is still, uh, he's still on the national stage um, and he can use, I think that his campaign is kind of functioning as a surrogate workers party right now, frankly. Um, and while that's still going on, he needs to, um, take, uh, take advantage of it as much as possible to be impressing upon the American people that they deserve better. So you're talking about the kind of immediate response that we will have as a society and the sort of days and weeks and months to come to the coronavirus, but, and I, I think everything you said is true, but uh, to zoom out even further and to take the kind of 30,000 foot view, there are people who are pretty uh, disillusioned, they're not disillusioned, disappointed, they're saddened, they're, they're feeling pretty crushed about where the Bernie campaign is at right now. And I am one of those people who has knocked on doors for Bernie and given a far larger share of my income than I probably could afford to Bernie Sanders. Uh, and, you know, wanted to see Bernie win, did everything I could to see him win. But what is insane right now is not that Bernie Sanders looks like he's going to lose the presidential nomination in the Democratic Party. What is insane is that we got to this point where we actually thought that Bernie Sanders could win that presidential nomination. We went from five years ago, socialism being uh, totally just a... Out in the wilderness, you know, socialist meetings were like the same, uh, you know, for extremely uh, old people. God bless them, these extremely old people for keeping the torch burning for as long as they did. But like it was it was a fringe ideology. It was not a, 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 a mass movement. It was not playing a vital role on the national stage. And five years later, here we're here we are. Uh, it is playing that role on the national stage. And so. If you if you again zoom out and look at the situation, we are in a great situation for our long term prospects, the left's long term prospects in this country. Whatever happens, whether we successfully engineer a dirty break, whether we elect President AOC in just a couple of years, whether we continue, whether you know we have a string of uh, you know different Trumps uh, being our president for the next <laughs> decade and a half or whatever. I mean, the left is in a very uh, it's in the best shape that it's been uh, in you know half a century, and we need to seize this moment. We need to recognize it for what it is, and we need to seize it. And the way to do that is to continue to run these kinds of class struggle electoral campaigns to continue to build the labor movement at the rank and file level to continue to fight for a Green New Deal, continue our, our fight for affordable housing, all of these things. And we think that the best way to do that is through joining the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, which has been the home for people like us who, who, who see the, you know, these opportunities and has uh, see the way to seize on those opportunities over the last couple of years. Um, as well as you know the uh, the uh, you know sunrise movement and, and all the rest of it, but um, in, in particular for us, I mean the DSA has been our political home. It's where we have. I mean it's where we it's where we came close together, Megan. You Aww. and I we met in the DSA, uh, and and you know you write. I think you wrote the section in the, in the conclusion is very moving about the the kind of uh, you know life defining moments that have come through you know, engagement in this movement in the socialist movement such as it exists in the United States. I mean, it's uh, it's it's been life changing and life affirming, and we've created closer friendships with anyone than we've ever with, with our comrades than we've ever had before. Uh, and uh, and we're we're winning. We're, there, there's sometimes small victories, and they're coming in dribs and drabs sometimes, but we are winning, and we are relevant, and we are are winning the war of ideas, and uh, in some cases, we're even winning uh, the war on the ground. Uh, so. People should have their their chin up right now. Um, I think that 
despite everything awful that's happening in the world right now, there's, there's in our lifetimes, there's never been a better time to be a socialist. And so people should join the socialist movement. It's, it's pretty great. Yeah, people should. I mean, I'll, 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 I will echo our man Eugene Debs to close us out. Um, the socialist movement has given me my ideas and my ideals, and I would not trade one of them for Jeff Bezos' bloodstained dollars. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so the book is called Bigger Than Bernie, How We Go From the Sanders Campaign to Democratic Socialism. It was out Monday. And you can uh, buy it from uh, Verso, our publisher. You can also get it from the Jacobin online store for the low, low price of twelve ninety five. I mean, Megan, really, where else are you going to be able to find a hardcover book about anything? You know, a a fucking Nora Roberts romance novel for twelve ninety five. That's hardcover. They don't, don't, they don't so. make hardcover Nora Roberts novels. Are they do. They yeah. can't. Have you? No way. You really didn't work at a public library <laughs> like I really? did. Where that, the hardcover Nora Roberts novels were flying off the shelf way faster than the socialist do they have tracks. The, do they have the raised the, the lettering on the front that's raised? That of course. Okay. Yeah, we don't even have that. Yeah. Damn, <laughs> that's, Damn that's, Nora. That's what you're paying for. So even the Nora Roberts novel, you will not be able to get hardcover for twelve ninety five. Maybe the the tiny the paperback ones that my mom read, you know, those are like five ninety five or whatever. <laughs> but uh, what I'm saying, folks, is that the deals are very good uh, and you should uh, get it from uh, the uh, Jacobin store online, jacobinmag.com slash store. And you should also uh, read Megan Day, who is writing multiple articles for Jacobin every week. So, uh, Megan, thank you for writing this book with me. Thank you, uh, Micah. You know, it was fun. I, I love you, Megan. I love you, I love Micah. You. Let's do it again. Let's write Aww. another book. <laughs> I think that'd be nice. Okay, let's, let's, I'm still recovering from writing this one, but maybe I'm get back to, to me in six months I'm or eight months go. or whatever. Well, who knows? Like after the, you know, if we're in still in the house in six months, we might need some new projects to work on. So that's true. Ne- next book, here it comes. All right, bye, Megan. Bye.